Hello and welcome to Check Marketing Trends, the podcast where we delve into the strategies, experiences, and insights that shape the dynamic of sales and marketing in the tech sector. I'm your host, Jacob Lundbrand, CEO of Bright Vision. In today's episode, we will be talking about crossing the chasm as a tech scale up in 2024. And we have a really interesting expert with us today, Paul Wiefels, who's managing director of the Chasm Group, a management consulting and advisory practice devoted to helping technology-based enterprises increase their revenue. He started his career in the heydays of Apple computer and started working with the Chasm Group in the early 90s and worked together with hundreds of tech companies for more than 30 years. So we couldn't find a better expert in this topic than Paul to help us here today talk about this. So without further ado, let's welcome Paul Wiefels to Tech Marketing Trends. Great to have you with us today, Paul. Thanks, Jacob. Great. Good to be with you. Awesome. And that was a very short introduction. So maybe we can get a little bit more meat on the bone here because you have done so much great things and have, you know, worked with such a long time with this interesting industry as well. So can you give us a little bit of background to who you are and what you've been up to so far and what you're doing now? Sure. Well, um, when I got out of graduate business school, I started in the consumer marketing industry, um, notably with a couple of big advertising agencies. And so I was a classically trained, you could say, um, kind of Procter and Gamble style marketer. And um, one of the agencies that I worked for uh, won a piece of business uh, associated with Bank of America Capital Markets, so where they do trading and things like that. And um, I had two introductions to tech in, um, in, in my agency life. First of all was the winning of uh, an account that was known for games, but had a computer and it was called Atari. So my boss and I won that piece of business for, uh, for our agency in Los Angeles. And when I left that agency and joined the agency in, in the Bay Area, we, we won uh, this piece of business for Bank of America. And they had what they called a treasurer's workstation. And this was a basically a, a very simple eight bit computer built around um, you know, CPM, I think was the, was the operating system on it. And they were impressed that I was the only person really in the bank or the agency who knew something about this and knew what to do with it and kind of wasn't scared about it and what have you. Um, so uh, long story short, um, I was recruited by Apple uh, back in the very early 80s. Um, and I was still you know, quite young at the time, but that's, that's how Apple rolled. Um, the the the, um, the 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 company was a very young company, and I was recruited into the company as uh, one of their advertising managers. So I spent seven years at Apple um, in a variety of different marketing uh, uh, positions, both domestically as well as with Apple International, that at the time was based in in Paris. So I had a you know, very very good best job of my life really with, with Apple in the fledgling years of the personal computer. Uh, I left them and became a head of product marketing for a software company. And it, during that time, I met a guy called Jeffrey Moore because I'd, I'd hired him uh, to help me do some stuff with a software company in his firm. And Jeff and I, um, you know, took a liking to each other and, um, when, when we sold the software company, I went back into kind of a division of advertising um, for a division of Young and Rubicam. Um, and Jeff called me one day and he said, hey, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of missing the tech industry. Um, he says, well, I just wrote this book and, and the, the manuscript that I'd given you previously, he says, it's changed around. Um, so I want you to take a look at it again. And I, I, I think we can actually do something if you're interested. And I said, sure, um, why not? Um, so that's how we started Chasm Group. So I'm, I'm managing director, but I'm also co-founder. So Jeffrey and I decided that we would do this until we had to go get real jobs again. <laughs> and so in 1993, we dubbed the company the Chasm Group and um, we went from there. 
so fantastic story. And just a personal side note to that, when I was in business school in the late 90s, I, I got an assignment from my brother who ran a small tech startup in Sweden at that time. And, and yeah. you know, and I was helping him with a marketing plan for the as a summer job. And, you know, the Cochlear model and the four Ps and all that, I just sure. realized that this won't cut it. And by coincidence, I found the Crossing the Chasm book uh, on Amazon, who wasn't that old. This was probably 97. And, you know, that took a, a career defining uh, <laughs> path for me as well. So that was a fantastic book uh, uh, and uh, awesome, interesting work you have done so far. In well, we stuff, built the so. we built the practice around. We we kept getting clients who would call us and say, um, "Gosh, you're describing. You described in that book. Jeffrey described in that book exactly what's happening to us. Mm -hmm. What do we do about it?" And so that's really how we put together a practice that was first built around these models. Within by that time, there was multiple books. So ninety seven. Uh, Inside the Tornado was also out, um, and we were working on IP that, you know, would be codified later in the early 2000s. Um, so we built a lot of model stuff, but we also started to do mostly around um, what, what my past experiences were, um, a lot more bespoke consulting, um, but still with a view towards we're going to specialize in technology. We understand the industry. We've got a lot of, well, now, a ridiculous amount of what we call pattern recognition. So we could understand what companies were going through and we could explain it to them in ways that were actionable to them rather than kind of the traditional management consulting of you know boiling the ocean to get data and then dithering over that data as to what it means and what we should do about it. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And it's so interesting because, yeah, I, I've met a lot of companies over my career as well who have uh, applied your models and, and so forth. So, yeah, really, really helpful. And let's dive into today's topic. You know, 2024, sure. it's, it's over 30 years since the book came out and you have published a lot of books and models after that, of course, as well. But uh, if we dive into a little bit of today, then if if I were to run the marketing as sales area of, of a scale up, a tech scale up, a B2B tech scale up, which is primarily mm -hmm. your your target market and, and would like to start working with the market developing strategy and, and so forth and understanding the market dynamics. What are the most important things to focus on in, in now in 2024 for a B2B tech company to accelerate their growth according to you? Well, I think I think the, the, the underlying principles of strategy still remain. So if I rolled back the clock 30 years ago, and then I advanced it 30 years to the present, I would argue that pretty much the basics of market development strategy, understanding who your target customer is, understanding why they would spend money with you, understanding what it is that they're looking to accomplish, understanding what their alternatives might be, understanding how you're going to, you know, position and talk about what you do. I think those are still basically the same, Jake. Mm. What's changed is the mechanics of actually operationalizing a strategy. So now we've got, you know, MarTech, marketing technology, you know, dozens of applications that, that mechanically um, do a variety of different things. Um, obviously, you've got a business built around, you know, aspects of those particular things, notably demand gen. So that has changed. The way that we reach an audience has changed. The way that we that we can engage that audience has changed. But what we keep coming back to is that's only as good as the strategy underneath it is. And if the strategy underneath it isn't solid or if it's based on people's opinions <laughs> rather than um, kind of the facts of the case, uh, or if it's based on wishful thinking, or if it's based in what I call looking at a mirror and thinking you're looking through a window, you're still going to have problems. And the other thing that we have found, Jacob, is that 
This increasingly has been, is a time-based competition. So companies, notably scalers, that are able to scale themselves in a very, very smart way, minimizing the number of mistakes that they make, realizing that they're going to make mistakes, that the ability to compete quickly is really, um, that, that has become a, a, there's a premium on being able to do that. Hmm. Rather than dithering over decisions, rather than you know taking too long to get product out, rather than taking too long to understand who the ideal customer profile is, you know I had a client the other day ask me, well, you know we need a template for an ideal customer profile, and I said, well, Google one. I mean, there's 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 lots of them, you know. I mean, they're all generic, they're all vanilla. Um, well, don't you have one? I said, well. Ours are bespoke. Well, why is that? Well, they're bespoke because the industry is just, is bespoke. So an ideal customer profile might look so something totally different for a semiconductor company than it would for a biotech company. So while you can kind of follow the same tenets of what you need to know, that's about as far as it goes. And I think there's a tendency to want to sort of genericize everything um, in that in in, in trying to you know go faster but you got to be careful about what you're doing now yeah uh super interesting and another problem where where we i mean what we see today is a lot of companies coming to market and i know you have written a little bit about it but yeah. you know i i think it's so interesting with crossing the chasm and and everything you have developed around that model you know but Going from a early stage market where you have an MVP or you know uh, a small product with an interesting technology, to actually uh, you know build a whole product and so forth, what are the common pitfalls that companies face during this transition, trying to build out their solution and things like that? And how do you typically work with companies in these stages to avoid sure. those problems? Well, a lot of that. Um... A lot of that is related to the fundamentals of crossing the chasm. So, uh, a, a a minimum viable product is a product that ostensibly is attractive to, and that you're trying to prove it, attractive to an early adopter. Mm. But a minimum viable product is not what traditionally a mainstream, more conservative buyers want. In other words, the great bulk of that curve, as you've seen it, you know what, what we call the technology adoption life cycle, mm -hmm. whatever Rogers called the diffusion of innovation. So the, the, the fundamentals there are essentially, you're trying to, in effect, restart and resize your market growth and what that ramp is going to look like. And the ability to do that is to kind of come back from a minimum viable product for a lot of people to a whole offer for a small group of people. In that, that whole offer, as opposed to the minimum viable product, the whole offer solves the whole problem. Mm. And that's very counterintuitive to companies who have been used to serving, oh no, we can do it for those guys and those guys, and this company over here, and this segment over here and this segment, getting them to come back to saying, yeah, but you can't, now you have to do it 100%, not mm. 80%. Mm. Because once again, it's the time-based competition. The company that can do it for 100%, stands a much bigger chance of getting the next what we call pragmatist customer mm. and that's that's uh, you know they're, they're just as we say there can't be any holes in the boat when you go out deep in the ocean so you know it's 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 fine if you spring a leak and you're kind of close to shore but once you kind of set sail for much longer distance you better have a boat that's solid and and that's that is the difference in, in this crucial transition. There's a variety of other things that we haven't got time to discuss uh, today, but, but there's, you know, you, you start looking at, um, oh, things that we might call minimum viable traction and minimum viable, 
you know, minimum re uh, revenue repeatability and things like mm -hmm. that. But I will argue that those are all a function of how well can we target a group of people who really need what we have and that we can solve the problem for them. Yeah. That's interesting to hear. And do you think the, a big problem that many scale ups or younger companies have is that they target the wrong beachhead segment or is it uh, more like, you know, it, it's it's more like a whole product definition that they are struggling to get together? Um, yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the, the, the beachhead segment is a, is a tricky thing to target. Um, there, there's, um, and, and I will go so far as to say that nowadays, and, and Jeffrey would probably take argument with me. In fact, I know he would, because we've had this argument before. Um, no sales force is actually ever going to go after one segment. I mean, mm -hmm. it just won't happen. So you're going to look at segments that are, um, we hope, adjacent to each other. I'm cool with that. That's okay. That's practicality, right? Um, the, 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 the challenge is to really have the discipline to be able to do that, number one, and then have the discipline to really say, we're going to have to let some other people go. Yeah. We need other customer opportunities go to focus our limited resources on being able to solve for this one. And so we have we have a number of techniques that we use, kind of a scoring system as to you know what segment would be better. Um, and and we we ask our clients to do that. So it's something that we get our clients to do because they're the ones that are going to have to live with it. In other words, we can bring in all kinds of data that will show, you know, well, the, the total available market for this is this, and total available market and this opportunity and over here. But at the end of the day, the company has to be adept at actually talking, engaging, and closing those people. So the mm -hmm. company has to have, um, all of our clients have to have a real sense of alignment and ownership around going for that group of people. And that's that's a process that, that we run with clients. Wonderful. Yeah. And if you move into a little bit on positioning and measuring, uh, how do you approach the challenge of creating unique positioning <laughs> and persuasive messaging in sectors where products are quite technical or yeah. even highly technical and also often in quite crowded markets? Yeah, yeah. Um, but let me just kind of step back a second. Uh, positioning, um, first of all, positioning is a very misunderstood uh, phrase, technique, um, art. Uh, it's a combination of all of those things. Um, but at its core, positioning is about deliberately choosing how you're going to be different. Notice that I didn't say better. I said different. Yeah, that's great. Right? Uh, and I'll come back to how better fits into that in a bit. Um, and so positioning really is about what trade-offs are we prepared to make in order for us to, as, a, as, as me and a lot of other people who do this, and I, I kind of specialize in this kind of stuff, to own you know, the, the, the cliche to own a corner of the room, right? Yeah. To own a, you know, if, if you looked at that company, you said, those guys are noted for that, right? Not these, all of these things, that, mm. right? Um, and, and um, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I obviously am a, a bit biased, but um, one of Apple's big advantages is that Apple owned a position its competitors never did in the, in the personal computer market. They never owned it. We did. We were distinct. We were different. People knew if it was for them and knew if it wasn't for them. You can't say that about any other product uh, at the time. So the, the, the idea that positioning is the first thing that sets the context for how people are going to assemble what a rational 
step of opportunities or options that they might have to choose something or not. So the, 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 the positioning is not really about explaining things. It's about trying to inspire people to see that the way that me, the vendor, and you, the customer, might have a match. And we can express that through messaging and, and you know, all kinds of communication engagement. But the, 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 the notion, first of all, of positioning as context setting, I think is oftentimes uh, uh, missed because people immediately want to lead to or jump to superiority. And of course, the first thing that we as human beings decide whether something is inferior or superior is what is the context of that in my life? In other words, how is that relevant to me? So as someone who does a lot of positioning, I want to be first and foremost, the most relevant to the customer that I'm trying to serve. Mm. And I'm prepared to give up customers where I would be less relevant to. And the reason why I am is because I also accept the fact that there are other alternatives out there that people could go to that they might be better served. So another thing that we look at is what are the alternatives that people would go to First of all, if I didn't exist. And second of all, if I did exist, but maybe I'm not exactly what those people are looking for. Now you start to see, okay, how do we go and sort of A, B this back and forth and back and forth. So, you know, this is this ultimately, you know, the process, and again, it's, it's, it's we don't have time to explain it all, but um, the goal is not superiority in positioning. The goal is maximal rev or maximum relevance for a given target group. If I'm relevant, if I'm maximally relevant, it's very easy as a student of consumer behavior, it's very easy to understand that people say, well, they're the most relevant, therefore, they're the best for me. Not they're the best according to Gartner, they're the best for me. And that's what we're really trying to, 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 um, to get at. Positioning is part of a business strategy. It's not a panacea, as some people would have you lead you to believe. It doesn't cure everything. It's not simply a marketing exercise either, you know, done by the marketing communications people. It's not a one and done. But it's not a, well, we got to change our positioning. Well, we just changed it last month. I know, but people aren't getting it. Right? Yeah. So Interesting. So, solid yeah. positioning is part of business strategy, mm. right? A fundamental core part of business strategy. It has vast implications across what you're going to build, who you're going to talk to, how you're going to operate, how you're going to brand yourself, how you're going to comport yourself. It's not simply, well, you know, we're for this person, unlike that, you know, it's not, a, it's not a statement or anything like that anymore. That's interesting. And that's quite different from branding and, uh, you know, are we a banana or an apple or, or kind yeah, of? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's brand, much branding, I, 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 um, a good friend of mine who, who I've known for years and years and years and who also is a very good uh, uh very good. Uh, she's a great author, uh, good, good, good marketer as well. Talks about branding as the as the um, as the emotional sibling of uh, the more emotive sibling of position. Yeah, and that's kind of always the way I've thought about it as well. Um, so I, I don't know what to brand if I don't know kind of what I'm you know positioning. There's a lot of a lot of ways to do that. Yeah, and but, and again, it's different, Jacob. It, 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 in B two C, right? Mm. Positioning is a different kind of exercise. It's related, yeah. but it's a different kind of exercise. Exactly, because the messaging in in B two C is so much different than the messaging in B two B. The way you go about it. So interesting and so hard to get right, also. And 
as we see today, there's so many companies competing for the space and the eyeballs. Uh, you know, we're having all these uh, campaigns going on in every channel these days. So what do you say to scale of today? How different must they be to be different? You know, because there is a lot of companies claiming to be best at the same stuff and so forth. So yeah. can you give an example of a unique differentiator or, or something like that? Uh, for a scale up today? Yeah. So um, the difference has to be, again, going back to that notion of positioning. When you are looking at a, you know, relatively large pond, you know, with a lot of fish in it, mm -hmm. right? How do you discern that? Well, the first thing you might want to say is, I wonder if there's smaller ponds where we can be a bigger fish. Mm. Right. So I wonder if we can serve markets that are underserved or not served or and again, this is kind of this goes back to business strategy, not simply communication strategy. Mm. So I want to go through the litany of, of things or the, 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 the rubric, I should say, of what really are my alternatives to serve customer bases that are poorly served. And there's, there's, you know, can I build something that other people can't build? Can I, do I have patent protection that other people don't have? Mm. Um, so there's, there's kind of those sorts of things. Can I reach people in a way that is cost advantageous to me and cost disadvantageous to my competitors? So the actual way I go. And then, can I talk about myself in ways that are not simply just in the tech industry, the traditional feeds and speeds, but in terms of what are the human outcomes for what I do? In other words, can I really speak to a customer both in human terms as well as in technical terms? Now, to be fair, <laughs> I'm not sure, um, and I've worked in just about every category known to mankind, I think, in the tech industry. Um, yeah. And there's there's obviously some I prefer and some that I that I you know um, I yeah. don't. Um, but uh, that's a little more difficult to do when you're selling semiconductors to mm -hmm. a design engineer. So I you know I, the design engineers I've met are not really looking for human human de term discussions about that. Um, necessarily but i don't know maybe they are you know um uh so the the the, the idea is that you know kind of the running thematic of what i what i believe in is what is it that you really do well right and who are the people that really appreciate the fact that you do that really well mm -hmm. right that's always the place that i want to get to right I do not want to try to win over the 8 billion people in the world, right? Because I can't do that. So I've got to try to win over the people who are going to be the base of my franchise and then expand from there. And, you know, we can, we can talk about um, some companies. Um, oh, gosh. Well, now nine, 10 years ago. I first started working with a company, and I'll name them because they're now owned by somebody else. The company was App Dynamics, and App Dynamics was a mind blower because they were in a category that was dominated. Uh, with what they did, obviously, was was manage applications, and what App Dynamics could do that their their brethren, their their competitive brethren, could not do is their secret sauce was their ability to show on a dashboard live time when an application was going to break or where it was broken. Mm -hmm. And the head of revenue for App Dynamics at the time said, I can show my customers a green light, an orange light, or a red light. The other aspect of that was that in certain cases, the App Dynamics app could fix the application, not dramatically, not in any significant way, but enough 
that would create a workaround. Now, the computer visions of the world and, 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 and you know, the BMC and everybody, well, you know, we can do that. It's like, yeah, but you can't do it in real time, right? You're going to have to do job tickets and people like that and things like that. Okay, well, that's a really cool, that's a really cool thing to do, right? Now, who do you think would really value that? People mm. in e-commerce, mm. <laughs> okay? Yeah. People like Expedia. We have no idea where our applications are. They may be through five different hops, right? Yeah. So I've got an application that's looking into the Western hotels, that's looking into United Airlines, that's looking into SAS, that's looking into, in, into you know, Scandia hotels. Um, I don't know where the thing is. I don't, I mean, I need that insight. Yeah. Right? I'll give you another example. I talked to the CIO of Union Pacific, the great big North American railroad, right? He says, how do you think we run trains? We run them on software. You know, engineer Bill is in, is in the, in the, uh, is in the front engine, but it's mostly just to kind of pull the, pull the horn, right? Yeah. If we get, if the software goes wrong and we have two trains coming in at, you know, put it this way, bad things can happen. Yeah. So we need this. A whole host of companies need this. Um, we had another client, again, acquired a client called Tonga. Tonga was the number one application on Salesforce's um, app site. Um, they made, sale, as they said, we make Salesforce better. And by the way, we only do it for Salesforce. We live on planet Salesforce. And oh, by the way, we have an NPS score that is three times that of the average software company. You will not fail when you use us. Really? That's... No, you will not fail. We have 365 day global support if something goes wrong, which it won't, by the way, but if it does, and we don't care if it's Christmas Eve, you're going to get fixed. Wow. So interesting. But a big question that sometimes comes up is that, you know, so some marketeers say that you should try to define your own categories. So you can be the winner in that category. For example, Christoph Lockhead, which we had here. Yeah. Yeah. last year and then yeah. i had a discussion with uh, uh somebody else who said no don't do it it's dangerous you know it's costing <laughs> a truckload of money and you might just fail you know <laughs> yeah so what's your take on creating a category or should you just uh, try to well, find your space all, within it's, it? it's 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 a never it, it's the it's the popular panacea of the day strategy yeah designed to sell books designed to sell workshops. Um, and I know all those guys. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, it can be done. But I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. You better, first of all, know what you're doing. Number two, this takes a hell of a lot more time than you think it's going to take. Yeah. And it takes a hell of a lot more money than you think it's going to take. And another thing that I've seen with these exercises is, so what kind of competitive moat do you really build around if, if you're around yourself, if you're in a market that has some massive competitors in it? In other words, if you're in the cybersecurity industry and you're going to create your own category, why can't Palo Alto and CrowdStrike just come right in and say, thanks, we'll take it. Mm, yeah. <laughs> right? So, I mean, I think there's an, an, an awful lot of what I'll call um, kind of wishful thinking in that, uh, in, the, in that exercise. Now, again, I didn't say it's rubbish. I said it can be done, but it's done. It, you have to do it, and there's a whole lot of moving parts to it that I think are not really adequately discussed in the whole conversation around it. And um, you know, it's it's uh, 
it is typically born out of um, what, what, what we see a lot. It's typically born, this, this, this idea of creating a category um, is typically born out of a category that's consolidated. Well, do you really need to create a new one? Or do you just need to create a new segment of an existing one, right? Because again, when you create a new one, you have lost your positioning context. Well, what is that? I don't, I don't, I don't have a, we don't have a line on our budget for that, right? I don't know how to explain that to management. I don't know how to explain what this category is to the board as to why we should acquire it. Um, I don't know how to explain to the analysts. Well, actually, I do, but I wonder if they'll say, no, it's not a category. Uh, and the analyst community can be, you know, as you know, fairly influential about things like that. <laughs> right? Definitely. So yeah. I, I, I think, you know, it, it, it's a simple, attractive and flawed strategy yeah it can be done you better know what you're gonna what you're doing yeah so um, it, again you run the risk just as a closing on it um if i'm going to do that and somebody and i i've constructed all of this and somebody looks at me and says that guy paul he's he's outstanding in this field or that guy, Paul, he's out standing in the field. Nobody around him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's wonderful, Paul. So uh, that's very interesting and, and super important questions for scale ups, you know, how to find your their space. So we could go on for, for the whole day, I can feel here. Yeah. So interesting. But as a final advice to B2B tech revenue leaders in scale-ups for the next 12 months, what do you think they should focus on and where do they have the most leverage on their time and resources from your perspective? Oh boy, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, let me let me just get my tactical announce, announcement out of the way. Yeah. Don't AI wash. Okay. Okay, yeah. So, That's a know, good one. I mean, Everybody does it, that. It's, it, it's, I, I think this pen is now has AI, or it was designed with AI, <laughs> or if yeah. I push it in a certain way, it's got AI. Um, exactly. Oh my God, are we going to get tired of hearing that? Yeah. So um, it's, it's. Uh, are you gonna talk about, you have it, or are you gonna talk about what it does? And if yeah. you talk about what it does, it better be doing something fairly important and fairly immediate to the problem at hand. Um, that's my that's my my tactical um, my 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 tactical advice. Um, more strategically, and I think that I know I mentioned this notion about you know time based competitions. So the 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 scarce resources that we have nowadays in business, um, I would argue, are time, talent, management, attention. The plentiful resources we have in this environment are money. I didn't say unlimited, but plentiful. There's lots of money. Over. There's lots of software and there's lots of service providers around. And what I have seen and what we advocate is that use your scarce resources, you a company on things that truly move the needle for you, that add value for you, right? That could be the building of product. It could be the building of, of you know, of, 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 of a tighter strategy. It could be recruiting better people. You know, um, competitive advantage is not created by technology. It's really created by people. So recruit the best people that you can get. Use your plentiful resources to do what we would call the hygiene of your business, with one exception. Um, so the hygiene of the business is things like, you know, can we automate everything that we need to automate without removing the human associated with that automation? And this, this is where I have a problem with marketing automation, marketing technology specifically. Automation does not make up for a bad idea. 
it just makes it go, it just makes it fail faster, right? And we can experience that every day by the amount of spam that we get. Why are people even, a, you know, we're not a software development house. And yet I get software developers, you know, we can help you with your development. We don't develop. <laughs> so you've missed right there. Um, so, you know, use money and, and software to, to, to build out to, to, and, and to ally with people that can take some of this hygiene. And where the service provider thing comes back in back and forth is there's two kinds of service providers. There's professional service providers like you and I who can actually help our clients make better strategies and execute better strategies because we do it for a living, right? And we live and die on how good we are at that. There's also people that, why do I need a great big in-house law firm if I can get an outside law firm to do all of that stuff for me, right? Why do I need to have business people roaming around the, the chasm group to do our accounting, to do our, you know, our billing, to do all of the things I don't, which is why we outsource it, right? Because then I don't have to spend any management attention on that. I'm still the administrative partner. Right. So that's that's what I think. You know, people. They, they, it, it sounds fairly obvious, Jacob, but I think people miss that because again, it's like you know, the, the next big thing comes in. Oh, here comes AI. Well, you know, there we go. Let's let's, you know, I mean, your dishwasher detergent will have AI in it. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I love Does that. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. Don't AI wash. Yeah, don't um, AI wash and, you know, use your resources, your scarce mm -hmm. resources on things that really move the needle and let other people help you on the things that may move the needle, but at least keep all the floors clean, the roof not leaking, you know, the mm -hmm. boat with no holes in it. <laughs> Love that. Thank you so much. This was so interesting and you offered so many insights. So I'm so uh, thankful for this interview. But people who maybe haven't read your books or haven't come across the Casim Group or you, Paul, where can we send them so they can read up more about you and your content? Sure, sure. Well, um, our website, chasmgroup.com. So that's easy to find. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. So I'm easy to find. Yeah. Uh, both on my LinkedIn site as well as on, on our website, um, you'll find articles that uh, uh, I've written and my uh, one of, another one of my partners who's also rather prolific in terms of liking to write. Um, you'll find a number of articles, some of the things that we talked about today. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, I, I would offer those as two, uh, two obvious places to go. Wonderful. We'll put them in the show notes. With that, Paul, thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much for all the insights. I wish you all the best with Kassim Group. And I sure hope to see you in Sweden soon again.